Hello and welcome everyone. It is time to enter the Kumi Day. Remember, this is not a sport. You don't play fight. What's up, fight fans? Today we're joined by Julius Holmes. He is a headliner at the fight coming up at XKO 55 on February 18th. Julius Holmes, thank you for coming in, man. How are you feeling right now leading up to the fight? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I actually uh, just got back from the gym about 15 minutes ago, so I had a Russian shower and everything so I could be on time. So. Nice. Nice. So how long have you been training and, and what brought you into MMA? Uh, well, uh, I started training when I was 16. Uh, I did traditional martial arts and then I joined the wrestling team in high school. And um, I... What got me into training really is I kind of, uh, I've always kind of had like a violent upbringing. You know, my uh, my dad wasn't a super intellectual, so uh, he was just a hardworking man. So when you get hardworking and then you combine that with put, uh, when you put your child in like violent things like um, football, you put them in uh, combat sports and things like that, it tends to come out um, pretty uh, combative. So it was just a natural leaning for me to go into something like this i enjoyed it i was good at it so just kind of went with it yeah man you definitely got that gridiron spirit that texas gridiron <laughs> um so when you say traditional martial arts what, what do you mean on that because i was a karate yellow belt when i was you know little so traditional martial arts what do you mean by that um so i did what, what's called a tongil low with uh grandmaster rodney thomas uh he's out in heb it's a, uh, it's, to me, it seems like a branch of Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of the uh, fancy kicks, but it was also more based in self-defense. And so I, st I started, I did that originally for about two years and then I went to wrestling and then I pretty much just stayed a wrestler until college. <laughs> yeah, the wrestling base, man, is just the lifeblood of MMA, dude. That is, yeah. that's the best foundation to have. I would say if you, if I could, pick for any potential fighter to start off with i would usually suggest wrestling just to have that foundation and then really branch out from there um so where do you train and I feel, think your team brings to the table that's special to them we got to give proper credit to where credit is due you know they're help building you into the warrior that you are yeah. well um thank thankfully my team doesn't need any um good PR from me. I train at Fortis MMA, so they kind of um, they yeah. kind of do that all on their own with uh, Saif and Ryan, Uriah, Jeff, Macy, Damon. Again, there's 19 people in the UFC, 20 people in the UFC with uh, Fernie, uh, Fernie Garcia going in on the last contender. So yeah, they uh, they do well. It's uh, yeah, This last five years, Fortis has been coming up on the map. You name it, uh, Fort Worth. I've trained with uh, Genesis. I trained with F3 uh, under Johnny Bedford. I trained with uh, Lamb Striking with Derwin Lamb. So, like, I've had a fight. I, I've had I had a fight under my traditional martial arts instructor. That was actually my first amateur fight. Okay. So, shout out to all of those guys for because uh, I learned lessons along the way. And no matter what level you're in or where you end up, you do learn from each teacher that you come across. So, mm -hmm. I've tried a lot, but Fortis is definitely um, the best the best place I've been, obviously, just yeah. with mines and then having Saif behind me, having the partners that I have with Miz, uh, Saad, uh, Jeff Neal, Uriah Hall, Obi, who's going to be on this fight. You're training with Jeff Neal and Uriah Hall, too. Dang, man, that is... Yeah. That is amazing. Do you have any side hustles or anything you do while you're advancing your career just to, you know, keep bills paid and everything like that? I uh, train. I do training and stuff like that. But other than that, just focus on fighting, really. Uh, I've been blessed and fortunate enough to be put in a position to where I can focus on training. Uh, most people at my level do not have that um, opportunity. So Good, man. Make the most of it. I, I believe in you. Um, so you had a rough start in your professional career, yeah. you lost your first two, Please. but I mean, this kind of experience would have deterred a lot of people to have that rose tinted glasses about their life, dude, but you picked yourself up by your bootstraps and you've been on a tear. I mean, you beat Mario Nelson and even Clinton Williams at, yeah. Williams at middleweight. And I was like, I was like, I didn't know he was fighting at 185. I mean, you filled out pretty nice for a middleweight, but, uh, 
I mean, that shows your true fighting character, man. So what drove you to take those losses and turn them into lessons to move forward? Well, um, I don't, I don't really uh, see myself as above anyone else in the aspect that it did deter me. Um, after those first two losses, I think I didn't fight again until 2015 against Jesse Palmer. And um, so I definitely did get deterred and it definitely did um, set me back a little bit, but I'm very thankful for it because I did have those rose, rose tinted glasses that you uh, spoke on. And the, the problem with that is that reality doesn't give a shit about what your vision or perspective is, you know? There's, uh, there's only one thing that is that can maintain successfully in reality, and that's the truth. And the truth of the matter is, is that I was pretty much just a brute. And so when I went up to professional, um, I took my first professional fight on six days notice and I cut 26 pounds. But since I was just a brute and I, I pretty much, we we're just going to fight. And um, yeah, I had a, I had a great um, killer instinct. And it was that if you, if the ref doesn't stop this, if you don't quit, then you'll die in this ring. That's, and I'm okay with that. That's perfectly fine because I expect that you would do the same to me. Yeah. And, but the issue with that is, is when that's not backed with skill, you see what happened in my first two fights when you make piss poor decisions. And then you also run into someone who's skilled enough to avoid you until your energy runs out. And so it, uh, it taught me very valuable lessons and it just set me on a path after that, that completely reframed my mindset. And so now becoming, like I said, uh, before we started, I did grow up like in a pretty, like I grew up a violent person. Like I just, I took to violence. And so becoming an intellectual, which, um, focusing on becoming an intellectual the past five, six years, it kind of took me away from that. And so now I'm going back to that and it's finally going to have, I finally am piecing together the killer instinct that I had mm. with the intellectual capabilities that I've grown to uh, learn and use the past six years. So, yeah, man. And I would say if I could choose a time to take some hardcore <laughs> losses to learn from it, I would like it to be in the beginning, you know, rather than later on in your career and you have this whole fantasy in your head that you're invincible, you know, yeah. now you've like seen that you're not invincible and you're, you know, you've worked to fill those gaps. Yeah. You know, just make yourself really hard to get out of there. <laughs> That's exactly. um, this time you're coming up against a veteran in Chris Pissero. I mean, we want to talk about high profile fights. This dude has fought people like James Vick, Alexander Hernandez, Damon Jackson, all of which are in the UFC or have been in the UFC. So what would a win over someone like this mean to you? And do you think XKO wanted you to take this fight to try to build your name off of him as a potential prospect? Um, well, that's a little bit of a tough question. Um, well, to get to the first point of what I see this doing for my career, um, I see it doing what every other win that I've had do, does to my career. Um, and I think XKO made this fight because uh, he he had to come he had to come up to 170 because I just he his career um, and I was looking for a fight at 170 and it matched perfectly. Um, I there, when you accept the fight with someone, there's a lot of assumptions or presumptions that have to take place. I'm not a fan of assumptions because it's usually not back with any um, any thought. So my presumption uh, for why they did that would be because he was uh, confident, let's go with confident, confident enough to take the fight with me. So, I mean, Chris Pacero is really good. So I feel like this is a, is a really good test, like for where you're at, you know, see if you're ready for that, that next caliber. Uh, and you've definitely bought like Mario Nelson's no joke. That dude is fast. He's strong and he's very well-rounded. When you're in there, do you view this as a war and your opponent is your enemy or do you have more of like a sportsman like mentality where this is a competition? Well, I mean, it's kind of like most things. It's both, <laughs> you know, it's a spectrum and it is a competition. 100%. You, you be fooling yourself. This I've never been in a war to where I agreed to meet a person at this specified weight on this specified date in this specified venue. <laughs> and we're gonna have a bunch of people watch. And if it gets too crazy, 
or have somebody stop it. Um, <laughs> I've been in a lot of battle situations and none of them have ever been that um, uh, civilized. <laughs> right, right. So it's def <laughs> it definitely is a competition, but it's, uh, it's by far the most warlike competition mm -hmm. because if, if I don't break him, and if I don't make him, if I don't cause him to rethink everything that he previously thought going into this, then it could end up bad for me. And I got enough scars on my face. I'm not that pretty as it is. So I can't mess it up anymore, you know? Was there anyone specifically that inspired you to become a fighter? Was there someone that you saw as a young man and thought like, I can do that or I want to do that? Um, uh, I mean, that, sheesh, that list is so long. It's I have, There hasn't been one individual that's caused me to fight. Like I said, I just kind of took to it. Um, like combat was just something I grew up with. So I already kind of had that natural comfortability in in such in a such in such an environment and so when i saw it on tv i thought it was cool and then i found out i can make money off of it so it's seemed like a simple living it was yeah. just to go uh, be a zoologist and let's be honest man 12 years of school was way too much for me yeah that's a long time dude that's I mean, and a lot of money later <laughs> why why fighting why is it that you you chose to pursue such a path that challenges the limits of your spirits and your self-confidence because something like mma when you're locked in a cage one other person like it's personal without suffering there's no true joy you can't have true joy true joy in the world if you don't go through suffering and uh, this is just one of the only things that i'm willing to suffer for um the society that we live in suffering is very avoidable and so if you want to find something that you're going to be happy with, then you have to be okay with suffering in it. And so this is just one of those things for me. Everybody has something and fighting's mine. I, I have such a love for all my opponents after the fight and I have love for their family throughout the entire process. Um, and I, I truly do wish all of them well, but when you're in the cage, and you you're beating someone and you see like the hope leave their eyes and like you look over and like you'll see like their family crying that's happened in a couple of my fights like it's just this weird primalistic thing that's uh hilarious joyful like it's it's a lot there's definitely that ultimate gain of respect when you're you know fighting with someone and then it's over it's just it's just that feeling of brotherhood afterwards you know like it's it is definitely something different you know when you're fighting off a wrestler for so long and then you know you're exhausted and then they get you on their on your back and then they're on top and you're like i want to quit but i can't quit because everyone's watching and i got two and a half minutes left <laughs> and those are the thoughts that i like to create if you wrestle in high school and college like if you're going to be any decent you have to not only enjoy that but strive for that because wrestling's filled with so many psychopaths, man, and it's so many, like there's six moves, there's probably like six, seven moves in wrestling. So it's not who knows the most moves, it's who does the move that I know you're going to do, mm. but I'm just so good you can't stop it. Like there's, like there's a crazy mental thing that happens when your opponent knows exactly what you're going to do, you know he knows, and you still have to do it to him even though he knows it's coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wrestling is something else, man. I think it's a little slept on today. Like, people who don't know, it's like, no. Yeah. When you're getting out wrestled, that that's exhausting. <laughs> Have another man, you know, put all their weight on your chest and your face. Dubbing your face into the ground, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wrestling will never be mainstream because it's too hard. It's too difficult to do. It's, it's so. very difficult to do. So a lot of people believe that someone's ancestry can influence their determination and their skill sets. Do you think there's any truth to that? And do you think your ancestry has equipped you with any specific attributes that make you the warrior you are today? Uh, no, not at all. Um, I guess I might have a skewed perspective on that being mixed. Um, uh, my, I think my family's from Western or Central Africa. My mother's Armenian 
So, uh, but they both grew up here in America. So it's like, mm-hmm. no, not at all. <laughs> I don't think, I think your, uh, I think your society can play a part in you becoming a warrior, but your ancestry means close to shit. I no. mean, <laughs> I like, you know, like, like a hundred, a couple, a hundred years ago, Americans were fighters. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like not even a hundred, not even a couple hundred, like literally 80 years ago, Americans were pure fighters. Mm-hmm. Eh, it's hard to find fires in the society now. You know what I mean? So it's definitely changed a lot in terms. Yeah. Of- so uh, I think your society plays a part, but not your ancestry so much because things change so much as societies grow. Where are you going? Where do you, where do you, where do you think you'll see yourself in? in five to 10 years. And if you could choose any MMA organization to be a part of, what would it be? Well, in five or 10 years, hopefully I'll be, I'll have the belt or be fighting for the belt in the UFC. Um, there's at this current moment, there's no other point in doing this. So, I mean, the, in, until another organization rises that can give you a uh, true freedom in life, which and what I mean by true freedom is that you, the choices that you make throughout it, throughout the day are your own. And that's every day, years on end. True freedom to me is having the money to uh, not have to think about what you're going to buy so much and not have to worry about what you can do. So until an organization other than the UFC can give you that true freedom, then it's, that's just kind of like the, uh, the obvious one. Yeah. But if something else comes up or if one FC rises, I'll go to one. I don't, I love Asian culture, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> one, one FC is doing really good. Yeah. Making all two videos free to watch and they're doing all these like clickbaity headlines and stuff like that. Like they're getting a lot of eyes on them now. So one yeah. FC is definitely coming up. You know, I do like PFL. I follow PFL as well. Yeah. You know, if you win the tournament and like the bracket tournament and that's a million dollars right there. Um, but yeah, UFC is definitely at least regarded as whoever the UFC champion is, is the best fighter of that weight class, right? The world, and there's yeah. just nothing that anybody can do about that as of right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's probably like two weight classes that that's arguable. In, right, you know? exactly, exactly. Shout outs, uh, obviously, thank you, Fortis MMA, um, Coach Knuckles with Team Autoconnors. Uh, my strength and conditioning coach, David Eli Quintana. Man, just thank you to my team. Hey, it was nice getting to sit here, learn more about you. I'm definitely looking forward to this fight. You definitely got that gridiron spirit, man. Everyone, this is Julius Holmes. He's going to be fighting on February 18th, the headliner against Chris Becero at XKO 55. Make sure to tune in. Thank you, everyone, for entering the Kumite with us here today. Remember, guys, this is not a sport. You don't play fight.